Hello, welcome once again. In this presentation, we shall be looking at vicarious liability for intentional or criminal conducts. Intentional or criminal conducts. And um, you would have noticed in the previous presentations on vicarious liability that most of the cases dealt with actions that could be regarded as negligent actions, okay? So in this presentation, the focus shall be actions that are intentional, deliberate actions by a servant or criminal actions by a servant. And um, a learning outcome for this presentation is, um, should I say one or two? You know, one or two. We, we shall look at, um, as we normally do, just, Briefly explain um, um, vicarious liability and um, move on to the core of the presentation, which is how or in what circumstances can an employer be vicariously liable for the intentional criminal conduct of the employee? So we understand the meaning of course of employment in this presentation. Once again, we'll just, by way of emphasis, we lead the discussion to course of employment and then understand the circumstances in which there could be vicarious liability for criminal conduct or intentional conduct. Now, we've ex we established that um, the principal or his master is vicarious liable for the acts of his employees committed in the course of employment, committed in the course of employment. And um, everything about liability then bothers on whether this person was working in the course of employment. The someone who says you if he is servant or an employee is doing what he's been authorized to do, is working that will be working in the course of his employment. If he's doing what he has been authorized to do in an unauthorized manner, he would also be doing, he will also be considered as working in, his, in the course of his employment. Or if he's doing something that is incidental to his employment, not directly what is employed, but a component, it's an incident of his employment, it will also be regarded as working in the course of employment. And um, in some cases, the questions have arisen whether some, if someone is committing a fraud or deception, or the, you know, on, um, concealment, misrepresentations, negligence, or omissions, whether that person is in the course of uh, employment. When you deal with in acts that are in negligent, that was they were not intentional, this rule of us, uh, that would someone who could apply but when you have an employee uh, committing a crime, like stealing, like fraud, like sexual assault, like rape, you know, it becomes difficult to give it a foundation for vicarious liability. In a lot of cases, the courts have held employers liable vicariously for the um, crimes of their employees because these crimes are also thoughts, you know, some crimes are also thoughts. And uh, you have Poland and John Pa and Sons Limited where the employee assaulted a boy whom he thought was stealing from the employer. And on um, the courts on the principle of the implied authority of an employee to work and protect the property of his employer, held the employer vicariously liable for this assault. We also have the case of Lloyd and Grace Smith and Co, where the issue brought on the fraud committed by the servant. You know, the servant working in the course of his employment and who had been represented as under authority, being their agent of the solicitor's firm. And he used that opportunity of being the uh, employee in the solicitor's firm to defraud a widow of her property. The court said that since he had been placed, represented as possessing actual or ostensible authority to make representations on behalf of the law firm, then the, the firm was responsible, was vicariously responsible for that fraud, even though that fraud was for the personal benefit of the employee. Also in Maurice and Martins and Sons, where the court that was, you know, billed to the employer was put in the custody of the employee who stole the, 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 the court. The court held that even though the stealing was for the personal benefits of the employer, 
employee and cannot really be justified under the principle that uh, the employee is working in the interest of the employer, which is one of the foundations of vicarious liability, the court held that the employer was vicariously liable because it was the, the component of the duty that the, the bailee owes to the bailor to protect the property that has been built. So these are some of the simple, simpler cases, if I can put them like that. But in some cases, we have to go deeper than that. So we've talked about the learning house comes earlier. Now we're going to um, you have uh, cases like Nahas and Pair House Management Limited. Uh, these are cases of theft by the employee, where the local court said that is a porter who uses keys to enter the, the 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 room of the of the plaintiff and so holds makes the employer, the landlord of that building, by closely liable. Because the component of the work of a quarter was the protection of the property of the guests of the tenants. And then you have the Fowler Security Corporation Limited against Oma Enterprises, where the security man also stole the, from the premises that he was meant to protect. This is the core of their. So the the anal the, the basis had always been that oh this is what you are employed to, to to secure. What were you doing? You were securing the property, even though you secured it in an unauthorized mode, in an unauthorized manner. That was how the Salmon test puts it, and he uses it as a basis for holding employees and employers vicariously liable. But um later, we have what is the time called the close connection test. That was the time that was created by the court. This test can also be found in the Canadian jurisdiction in the US and other countries. But we are focusing essentially on the English jurisprudence in this presentation. In Lista against Esley Hall Limited, this was a case of a situation where uh, the, the, the warden of his boarding house for boys, boys were kept in the boarding house as a form of correctional place for, you know, like a buster home. And these boys over the years were systematically abused by the Water, yeah, the warden that was meant, who was meant to take the care of them, was almost like a parent, like a like a mother taking care of the child. You know, slept in the same room with them, took them into bed, and did all sorts of things. And later, it came out over the years, uh, years after most of those boys had grown up, that he was abusing them sexually. And so they brought, as adults, brought this case before the court. And the court said that the House of Lords in England said that, you know, there will be vicarious liability for intentional wrongdoing, for intentional wrong wrongdoing, including this criminal wrongdoing, if there's a close connection between what the employee was employed to do and the wrong that he has committed. Is there a close connection such that you can say that while he was doing it, he was doing what he was employed to do. If the it, he was doing it in an unauthorized mode. If we use the sound test, for that purpose. The court was able to do this and overrule Trotman and not Yorkshire County Council, which on similar facts had initially been held in the in the Court of Appeal, in English Court of Appeal, that there could be no vicarious liability in such contest. This Trotman case were overruled. So if you also had to buy aluminum company against Salam and Majorski against guys in Stormont Hospital, where the employer was by cross liable for the harassment of an employee by another employee. We've been looking at my um um the case of Dubai Aluminium Company against Salam later. Now the close connection text requires that you look at what to know whether there's a close connection. Look at the job that the person was employed to do. What is the nature of the job? What is the purpose of the job? You know, like the uh, Esther case, uh, you know, that we just looked up at, for instance. The nature was a job that required a, a, a close relationship, a relationship of absolute trust. And the children were vulnerable, of absolute dependence on the woman. And so what is the nature of the job and the purpose of the judge? The, job, the purpose of that job, the essence of that job was to protect these children from that kind of abuse and any kind of vulnerable, vulnerabilities that they may be exposed to. And the person that had been employed to take care of that was actually the person that abused them. So you also look at the circumstances and context in which the acts took place, especially in the context of the case that we just looked at. 
And that in that con in that um consider in those considerations, you'll be able to determine that there's a close connection between what the employee was employed to do and what he actually did. It has been held, and you must take note that if what the employee did was just a private act of passion, resentment, or spite, then this would not be regarded as a close connection and would be regarded as being outside of the scope of the employment. In fact, the employment, the employee can be said to be on a frolic of his own. So how to draw this line is a reflection of the case considerations. Close connection cases. Let's look at some of the cases where this close connection test has been applied. So in Dubai, a living company against Salah, where a solicitor committed fraud on a client in, the, in his law firm, the House of Lords, and Lord Nichols said that perhaps the best general answer is that the wrongful conduct must be so closely connected with acts the, the partner or employee was authorized to do that. For the purpose of the liability of the firm or the employer to third parties, the wrongful conduct may fairly and properly be regarded as done by the partner while acting in the ordinary course of the firm's business or the employee's employment. Can we say that if it was just in the normal course of being at work and doing what you are employed to do, that you are able to perpetrate the fraud or do the criminal act that you are being accused of? So that's the, an expansion or expansion rather of the close connection test by Lord Nichols. Then you have Matis and Pollock, where the court of appeal held a nightclub vicariously liable when the bouncer that they employed stabbed the guest outside the club. Now, in Matis and Pollock, this, the, the, the stabbing was as a result of an altercation between the bouncer and the, the guest and his friends earlier. Home. So it was more an act of revenge. But the court held, and the rationale really was that um, there was, there was, uh, the employer had created the, the hostile and had the orange hostility and aggression by the bouncer and had created the, the platform for that to take place. And so when he now used that platform to, 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 to revenge, so to say, the employer would remain vicariously liable. You have previous claimants against Catholic Child Welfare Society. We had, again, boys that were in a boarding house were abused by those who were supposed to be in their custody, who were supposed to keep them, watch them. They were boys that were like being rehabilitated in one way or the other. And the court again held that there was a close connection between the employment and the abuse. The employment did not just give opportunity. And that distinction you will find in a lot of cases is that there's a difference between an employment giving you opportunity to abuse and, the, and an employment that is close, and, and an act that is closely connected with what you are employed to do. If, for instance, in these cases, it was the gardener that was abusing the children, or it was a painter that was brought to paint the buildings where they used their, their drums that was abusing them. This, this kind of people merely had opportunity. The employment, you would have given them opportunity to have access to the school, to have access to the boys. They are not in the nature of gardening, the nature of painting, the nature of being the cook in the school may, has nothing inherent in the protection of these children from sexual abuse. So that employment would have only, that job would have only given them opportunity to have access to the boys. And the employer would probably not be vicariously liable in those contexts. And you also have Mahmoud and Muhammad against Morris Supermarket, where Mr. Muhammad inquired from the supermarket pro, uh, staff whether there was, whether they were selling printing materials. And the employee, you know, threatened Mr. Mahmoud and as you know, assaulted him. Even when he was trying to was doing that, his supervisor, his supervisor tried to warn him to stop, but he refused. So he, he threatened him and he, you know he seriously assaulted uh, the plaintiff. And um, the court said that the employee was employed to attend to inquiries, to attend to customers, to attend to those who come into the employer's premises. And what was he doing when he when he was threatening and assaulting, he was actually attending to Mr. Muhammad, and therefore the employer was liable. Despite the fact that you know that the, what, what the employee did, 
he was even trying, you know, the supervisor tried to stop him. What he did had no benefit to the employer, but the court said that he was acting in the course of his employment and the vicarious liability. And the UK Supreme Court held in that case that you should ask yourself some questions. What functions or fields of activities had been entrusted by the employer to the employee? What are the functions, like in this case, the employee, what, are, what field of activity? This was what he was supposed to do, to listen and to respond to his inquiries. And what was he doing? He was doing that and used that platform to abuse and to assault the claimant. And so then that you should ask whether there was a sufficient connection between the job and the wrongful conduct, such as to make it right for the employer to be vicariously liable. Was there a sufficient connection between what he's been told to, was employed to do, to attend to, to the inquiries, and to you know in the in the employment and what he did that was what he was actually doing when that took place. So um, you also have more since supermarkets against various claimants where the in this case <laughs> the employee was actually he had a grudge against the employer. He was an IT auditor, so he got home and he used his own computer in the house and uploaded on the internet the personal data of staff of the employer. So the, the staff whose data were uploaded online sued the employer for wrongful disclosure of private information. And they sued the employer, of course, to make him the employer vicariously liable. And they tried to argue, argue that the employee was not acting in the course of employment, you know, that what he did was completely outside his employment. And the court agreed and said that what the IT auditor it was an internal IT auditor. So that means it was an employee. He wasn't an independent contractor. What he did was not closely connected, connected with the tax which he was authorized to do. And that he was not in the course of employment. He was on a frolic of his own. He was not frauding the employer's business. He was merely pursuing a personal vendetta because of the grudge he had against this employee. You see that you have to take these cases on a case by these issues on a case by case. Business and look at the context, the employment, and the circumstances of this closure. Perhaps it was inside the office premises. I was using the company's computer, you know, in the, during the working hours. The probability was there that it could be said that he was acting in the course of his employment. In some Canadian cases, like Basley and Corey and Jacobi and Griffiths, the close connection text has also been used to be able to use uh, to be able to uh, make employers vicariously liable for intentional or criminal conduct. So in summary, therefore, the jurisprudence on vicarious liability uh, has continued to evolve when it comes to intentional or criminal conduct. The law requires that the servant must be in the course of his employment. And the issue had always arisen whether when a servant is committing a fraud or intentional act of any kind, whether fraud or stealing, or even the grievous ones like sexual assault, or rape, like harassment, you know, like bullying and what have you, whether you can actually say that they are working in the, and they are acting in the course of their employment. Since no employer would actually expressly say that you should go ahead and commit such crimes and intentional wrongs. And um, in answering this question, there is the need to have a clear understanding of the meaning of cause of employment, which we have established through the Salmon test that says that if you will be doing something that the employee was authorized to do, or doing what he was authorized to do in an unauthorized manner, or doing incidental acts. But when it comes to intentional and criminal conduct, in order to determine whether this thing was an unauthorized, unauthorized mode of doing what someone that is an employee is authorized to do, the courts have created some principles, and these principles may make an employer liable vicariously, even when the act in question, when the wrong in question, was not beneficial in any way to the employer. So the, in a lot of cases, the principles for determination of vicarious liability for intentional and criminal conducts have emerged, and they continue to grow. These cases have established that there could be vicarious liability by the employer or master for intentional and criminal conduct that is closely connected to what the employee is employed to do. And this close connection is determined by the nature of the job and the purpose of the job, as well as the circumstances and context in which the act that is in, con that is in context consideration took place. The cases that have established these are many. Some of these are listed 
in this presentation. And um, these cases continue to grow and to make the law clearer in so many um, ways. So these are the considerations that um, come into play when it comes to vicarious liability for intentional or criminal conduct. Don't forget what we said again. The premise is that we want to determine whether we could use the traditional cost of employment test to determine the employer's liability, vicarious liability for the act of the employee, where it is criminal or intentional. And we have established that um, the cases have continued to grow to reflect the consideration that there must be a close connection between the employment and the wrong of the um, employee. So these are, this is another aspect of interpretation of cause of employment. Another aspect of interpretation of cause of employment. If there is no close connection between the employment, the work that the employee has been employed to do, and the wrong that is in consideration, then the employee remains personally liable. He's on a frolic or his own, and the employer would not be vicariously liable. So um, at the next presentation, we will be looking at another component of vicarious liability. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and share.